Cool. Well, okay, so how many of you are here because you like science? No hands? Oh, there's some hands. Okay, good, 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 because that would have gotten really awkward. <laughs> how many of you are here because you like superheroes? Okay, cool. We got we got some of some of one, some of the other, some of both. I like this. Well, I have obviously assembled this amazing superhero science team today to talk to all of you about the whole chicken and the egg parody. You know, the sci-fi inspires the kids to become scientists. The science inspires the really cool writing about superhero powers and tech. So, to introduce themselves is this amazing panel. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I was like, mm. hi everyone. Um, I am. My name is Karen Chen. I am an assistant professor at North Carolina State University in the Edward P. Fitz Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering. I do research involving virtual reality, augmented reality, and how they could be applied to uh, saving people's lives in healthcare. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Jeremy Whitley. I am a comic book writer. I uh, write The Unstoppable Wasp for Marvel Comics, uh, which is how I ended up here. Uh, and then I also write uh, other books like Princess and Raven the Pirate Princess and Rainbow Bright and My Little Pony. My Little Pony is very heavy on science. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris Sims and I write comic books like Dark Hawk for Marvel Comics and Sleepwalker for Marvel Comics, which you can buy at my table which you should, because i got to get dinner tonight. Uh, and I, I believe that we are arranged in terms of who knows most about science to who knows least about science. Yeah, we might need to swap here. I mean, in the, in the guests. The guests. You're, you're the Hawkeye of these science Avengers. How dare you? <laughs> I just make it all up, which is fun. I like it. I like it. So I am Tamara Robertson. Um, those of you that watch the Discovery or Science Channel may know me from Psyjinx or more likely Mythbusters, Mythbusters Jr. and Mythbusters The Search. Not in that order because that was a little bit backwards. Um, so I love to go across the nation and talk about superhero science. It's one of those things that everyone loves superheroes and it would be better for our nation if everyone also loved science. So we are going to kind of delve into the realms of what has inspired us with regards to what we do, whether it's the comic side or the science side. For instance, I am obsessed with science because I grew up as a Trekkie and I was in love with Scotty the Engineer. So as a chemical and biomolecular engineer, I am somewhat following in his footsteps. I'm hoping to eventually have my own enterprise. But what about all of you? What was it, um, technology or the opposite way, um, comics that inspired you to do what you're doing now? I will go next. Okay. <laughs> so, from what I could remember in my childhood memory, the first comic or manga that I came across was Doraemon, the, the, the robotic cat with a four dimension pocket and then you constantly pull different gadgets out of the pocket. So, that was my first techie and sciencey Relation to comics. Um, that's a good question. Um, I I started writing comics. I think very. I started loving comics. I think very young. I, I uh, read a lot of X Men as a kid, um, and X Men has uh, a somewhat uh, wavy relationship with science. It uh, talks about science and then promptly ignores it mostly. Um, it's like, hey, genetics are a thing. Um, and then, yeah, it doesn't uh, really delve into that at all. Um, but uh, I think um, I've, I've always been uh, a fan of science. Uh, it's not, not as much uh, something that I, I felt like I wanted to do, but it's one of those things that uh, I'm prone to, to look at and be like, oh, that's cool, which I guess is how some people feel about comics. Um, it's cool. It's yeah. cool. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I, I like I like for my I've always been a fan of Marvel and I think Marvel has a lot of like science at its base of, of what makes characters super. 
Um, and so I, I've always liked to uh, pull in cool new things science-wise into stories and, and make, make science uh, in the stories things that uh, kind of checks out uh, or, you know, that uh, the basis is there for it and it's just extrapolated to some sort of future nth degree, which, um, you know, is, is, is I think what makes for, for good sci-fi storytelling in general. As someone who's written the X-Men, I would really like to see like the Marvel Universe Punnett Square, where it's like a white rabbit and a brown rabbit and then a rabbit with laser eyes. <laughs> I think that would be really fun. Uh, I, I, I grew up reading comics, obviously, and I grew up watching, you know, I, I was also a, a big uh, Trek head, which is, which is the term my wife came up with when she didn't want to say Trekkie. Uh, but yeah, like, the appeal of that stuff for me was always in, in the idea of what is possible versus what sounds like it might be possible versus what you know is very not possible, but it's still fun to read about. And I feel like all three of those uh, categories are equally represented in comics. And the, the further we go, the more those last two categories become the first one. And I think that's really cool. Like, I think that's a really cool thing to see as comics and sci-fi like influence what we think about and what we want to do and what we're willing to pursue in the real world. Like, that's always been a big thing for me. Yeah. And I would say it's a question I get a lot, um, especially as an engineer, of if it bothers me when the science isn't right, um, if it takes me out of it and makes it so that I'm not enjoying it. I know we all know that some pretty important astrophysicists have posted about gravity taking them out of the moment and, and messing with them. Um, but I've always kind of felt the same way. I love how it inspires me to think about like, well, what do we have today that could get there? Or what already exists in nature that kind of does the same thing? Um, and so actually, Dr. Chen, I'd like to talk to you about, you know, you work with virtual reality and augmented reality. And these are technologies that, I mean, since I was little, we've seen shown in some way in sci-fi films. Um, but they've also been evolving on their own outside of that. Um, do you find that you feel like the tech is represented correctly, incorrectly? Do you think it's helped it evolve or stunted it? Right. So I would say that it's kind of like a mix. Um, in my opinion, the technology influences what we see in movies, in animations, in comics, in manga. So uh, with my research, which has to do with virtual reality and augmented reality, and as early as the 60s, that was the earliest documented virtual reality technology. It's definitely not as fancy as what we see nowadays, the modern day, the 21st century virtual reality technology, but back then it was pretty cool. And then this chronological timeline, now it comes to like Star Trek time and where they had a uh, holodeck and there is the um, emergency medical hologram. Um, there are all these virtual uh, holographic 3D characters and in my definition of virtual reality and augmented reality that is really part of it. it you can't really touch it but you see it in 3D it's in front of you and it's interactive uh, so and then moving now to current technology I think uh, we have really advanced our existing computer chips and now it's a lot faster processing power. We are now like up to speed so we can really experience what we saw on movies, these concepts that we saw in Star Trek. So today I brought a, a prop and many of you may recognize this or you may not have seen it before. Um, it's an augmented reality headset and where you, yes you can. I'll be your demo model. You can wait. How do I put it on? You would <laughs> unscrew this, and so it's a little lighter, okay. uh, and then you put it over your head. Okay. And then these lenses right in front, it will show Tamara these holograms essentially, and then they would show up in 3D in her view. But then at the same time, she's also able to interact with the physical environment. So it's got the, both the virtual and the physical. 
this came out in 2016, so that is definitely way after where Star Trek first came out. So that was the, the, the sci-fi, and now there is the technology. And then I would say this continues to affect the sci-fi, the superheroes and superpowers, and movies. Um, so I am an anime and manga fan, and um, I watched uh, Sword Art Online, which is a series of animations that had to do with uh, how a bunch of online gamers that got trapped uh, in their server, and they were playing virtual reality games. So that was in, and then they have uh, and I should say, um, an augmented reality version that came out in 2017. So that was after this headset came out. So it just continues to affect each other. So whether it's chicken, egg, I really can't say. I would say they're really connecting and influencing each other. And is there going to be a, a moment where we can start watching all of our like science fiction on here too and be part of it, you think? Do you think that's where we're going next? With, with the comic world? I would say this has the capacity to do it, and with the, I would say, increasing processing speed and processing power of technology, we can really experience what we used to see in movies, but now having our hands-on technology and experience it. Hmm. Very cool. And kind of along those notes, you know, one of the things I really love um, about Star Trek, for instance, is uh, the replicators, right? All how they could make their own food, um, and that's actually going on right now. Like, I don't know if you guys have um, read about this, but uh, NASA's looking at 3D printing food because obviously, as we start looking at trying to go to Mars, um, you're going for so far, and having to be able to grow your own food and have all that weight is is a harder thing to manage than figuring out how to 3D print something. So it's really cool because we we're actually talking about the, how the Holy Grail is a pizza. They want to be able to uh, 3D print a pizza. But there's actually, I think it's in, I want to say it's in Japan, they have a 3D printer that can make cocktails. And it, it does droplets into it that it makes it in the end taste like a cocktail without actually having the ingredients that you would need to have it. So it's really weird how technology is, is getting there. Um, and one of my favorite examples, uh, too, is that Raytheon has uh, made an Iron Man suit. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but it's like crazy. Like, so they're, they're starting to get these exoskeletons that are getting closer and closer to what Tony Stark has. So, Jeremy and Chris, the question I would have for you is, is with the science and tech that you've written about that isn't real, if you could pick one item to make it real, and this is not a question that they had given to them before this, um, which one would it be? And if you need a moment to think, I can continue talking about tech that is related to comics. Or food. Or food. I can talk about food for hours. Uh, I mean, I really like the, the, the lab in Wasp, where you go in and, and time is, is different, and so you can hit all your deadlines, and get a bunch of stuff done. Uh, that one was pretty good. I, God, I don't know. Like, here's what I've written about. I've written about a giant tuning fork that can kill Galactus. <laughs> Probably not that handy. Uh, and Darkhawk, who has a robot body from space that uh, can turn into a giant mech and shoot lasers out of his chest. Probably more handy, but none of us want me to have that. But could could we put our conscious in that robot body? Is like is that an option? Like I I, I mean if you obviously if you body. use the Darkhawk amulet that was created by the Shi'ar Empire. Oh okay of so course. You have to find them first. So it's gonna be like an Indiana Jones search. Okay, I got this. <laughs> yeah, so you gotta have the magic to do the science. That's uh that's a problem. I mean um, Magic really is science. They just don't tell us what they're doing. I mean, if you guys have ever seen Impossible Science with Jason Latimer, it is it is science, but it is math. I don't know how it happens. Uh, let's see. I'm. I'm I, I I have come up with so many like little things for Wasp that are um, uh, strange, and I I don't know how useful they are in some cases, uh, but um, are not necessarily like powers. Uh, I have one of my characters is, is using uh, pim particles to, to treat disease now. Um, oh, wow. Is uh, using them to shrink cancer cells, um, uh, which I was like, this is why aren't why aren't people using pim particles for actual like real life problems? They're just like I want to shrink more and be giant. Um, and then um, there's uh, I think my my favorite 
one I came up with, which is came out of a story that we talked about, I think, at the last uh, panel uh, about uh, acacia trees being able to uh, communicate uh, by a smell, um, and how like uh, so I, I came up with this idea of like uh, being able to to transfer that over uh, genetically to other things, to where like uh, they can other plants or uh, animals can like pass messages, uh, you know, through through basically the uh, through pheromones. So you can you can consciously transmit messages to you know uh, these other uh, other types of creatures. Um, that would be be cool. It's you know it's, it's sort of a science psychic thing, um, but you know uh, yeah the, the idea of a plant psychic uh, I think is fun. <laughs> And there's actually like a whole um, field of science that's evolving around that exact idea of taking living organisms and making either robotics based off of them or structures based on them. It's called, bi it's called biomimicry. And so it's really cool. I was, when I was sitting in the airport this morning, I was seeing they have a robot now that they've copied a iguana's tongue, I think, or it might be a chameleon. And so the way that their tongue works is when it hits something, it forms both an arc around it and a suction in. So they're now developing a way for robots to be able to pick up absolutely anything by copying a lizard tongue. Well, that's so, very funny. Yeah, so. But it's actually um, a historical example of a comic spurring uh, technology development was with ankle tracking bracelets. So Spider-Man in the, um, I mean, I'm gonna actually give you the near, in the 1960s, Spider-Man was given this, this tracking device and it was not until 1983 that this sheriff um, and judge, they were dealing with this problem that when they would let inmates, they had too, uh, too many inmates in the system, so they were trying to figure out how do we actually help them recoup and let them go home and help them be rehabilitated. And so they were looking at Spider-Man, they saw this tracking device and they're like, that's brilliant. Why don't we just do a tracking device and let them go home? And then we know if they go somewhere that they're not supposed to. So, you know, com what you guys are doing today could happen. I mean, I would love some pin particles for packing, minimally. I, my, my luggage is literally bigger than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, pin particles are interesting and in, in the, they become one of those things that uh, in in comics that like, oh yeah, it's a common thing, you have pin particles, they can make things bigger and smaller, but has like, they, they just sort of like retro invented the scientific basis for it, which is like, somebody's like, oh, how does it work? It's like, oh, it moves the molecules closer together, which is not, it's not really science, it's just, it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> is that more or less scientific than the DC version, which is the white dwarf star material? where uh, Ray Palmer finds a chunk of white dwarf star that's about this big that would weigh like 18 sextillion tons. Like it would be heavier than the planet Earth. And he picks it up. He finds it on the ground and picks it up and takes it home. <laughs> and then it smashes and makes the Earth fall. And, and he's just super ripped. <laughs> oh, hey. Or for and someone else to buy. You get there before it happens. Or we won't, and we'll sell your stuff. <laughs> well, awesome. So, speaking about like comics um, inspiring and and doing things well, like who's what's a tech or a, you know a writer like a universe that that does do it right that that really showcases something. Um, scientific tech-wise well, and then who's someone that doesn't, doesn't really get it well at all, and it, it is something that it bothers you when you read it? There is nothing I hate more in comics than when somebody uses 100% of their brain. Because uh, the whole using 10% of your brain thing is nonsense. That's not real. Like, it's, that's complete nonsense, and everyone should know that by now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like Death and Terminator, he uses 90% of his brain not okay. I guess that's I guess that's why you can play Batman. Still Deathstroke is all he could come up with. Huh? <laughs> uh, yeah that that one bugs me. Everything else in comics I'm very forgiving of. You wanna have dudes riding on a dinosaur is fine, but 
that one, that one gets me every time. Yeah, I think uh, the the one the one that's sort of the classic example that like just even as a kid just pulled me right out of it uh, isn't even from comics. It's from uh, Superman the Motion Picture, uh, where uh, Lois dies, so Superman wants to get her back, so he reverses time by flying backwards around the world and then making the world reverse its orbit. Which I was like, I can't imagine that at any point that was, like, people thought that was feasible. Like, that's not even the best possible fictional explanation you, you could have been able to come up with. It, it feels like somebody would have immediately gone, what I did as a kid, which was like, if you just stopped the Earth and made it go the other way, everybody would die. Yeah. They'd probably go flying off the world. Or, you know, it's something worse. Like, it, that, that doesn't even begin to seem feasible. Mm. It's less feasible than being put in a little square. <laughs> Phantom Zone. Y'all know about the Phantom Zone? Yeah. Like, yeah, for me... Now it's getting a little better, but previously what bothered me most had to do with time travel. But I think when I always had this question and talking to other friends, they would try to make me think along this mysterious dimension that we don't see and then give me this rationale how ants only see two dimensions as opposed to now we, like, but for humans we see three, so perhaps there's some other species that sees the other time dimension. So try to help me wrap my head around this idea. And then later I became a little more forgiving. I think, okay, everyone has the right to dream and not being trapped in the physical world. So uh, why not? I'll just take whatever. If, I'll just take it as yes, it is. For me, it's all fake. So. You can <laughs> Don't take the dreams away from other people. It's all, it's all it's real. Tell them that. So you can do whatever you want, but there has to be some kind of consistency to it, right? And it's all fiction, but it's a fiction where we're already asking you to buy into so much. Uh, I think it was it was Mark Wade, your buddy, uh, who said that like the entirety of the DC universe is an inverted pyramid resting on the idea that no one can see through a pair of glasses. And the second you start picking at it, and the second you give people a reason to be like, well, that's not, that doesn't work, then it all crumbles. So it's, I, I think it's fine to make things up, but you either have to make it sound plausible enough that people will buy it, which is something that you do, or you, you go far enough in the other direction that it doesn't matter, which is what I usually do. Yeah, I, I like to, I, I, my, I think my theory with working with uh, uh, faux science in, in comics is uh, anything that you can draw a diagram of seems real. <laughs> it's like... Everything's real. It's like, yes, well, you can travel from one point in space to another via, via like, a, a teleportation, as long as it folds it in half, like, as long as it folds space. And there's something in between here, but you're, you're just basically passing from this point to that point. Because I can demonstrate that with a piece of paper. And you can go, oh, well, he did just fold that piece of paper. That seems right. <laughs> um, you know, it's a, I, I feel like anything that you can make a, a decent, convincing diagram of, uh, that's, that, that's, that's the test it has to pass for me. Do you know what my favorite example of that recently is? It's when D DC had the, uh, the multiverse map. Hmm. And it's the map of all the... Because there are only 52 alternate Earths. <laughs> but they put them on a map. But then if you turn that map over, that's the dark multiverse on the other side where all the bad ideas come from. Brilliant. Brilliant. I've always wondered where all my ideas come from. <laughs> dark multiverse. Dark multiverse. You're underneath. You just flip it over. I, I definitely think that for me, it's... The thing that drives me crazy is when they take actual scientific principles that we know that have been proven and they mess those up where it's just like someone just didn't even like do the research uh, enough to find it out. So I know like, especially as someone that like worked in buyers for a long time, like when I see people and they're not wearing the proper protective equipment. In a lab, I'm always like, 
Come on, that's so easy to know. You just ask any friend of yours that's a scientist, you know, and it's like one of those things I'm like, I, I'm, I'm willing to at any point edit, just call me, let me let me talk. I will look through and be like, okay, this actually is a real science thing, so let's let's showcase that correctly. There's actually a whole board of scientists at UCLA that that's what they do on weekends. They have writers and movie people send them crazy questions and they get together over drinks and they write the actual responses of how it would be and why it's not right. And then they go, but you know, make it crazy and make it so the kids are inspired to try to figure out how to make it work. But gravity is gravity, so if you're going to be on Earth, then you probably should have regular gravity and let it work the way it does. So. Yeah? Yeah. Have you guys ever written anything that's made the, made the internet universe mad at you because it was not scientifically right? No. No? Never? Not, not for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you've made the internet mad at you, Chris? Um, I was a critic for several years. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> just, too many jokes, I couldn't get any of them out. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, bud. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think I've done, um, for the most part, I've done a pretty good job of catching those, I think, early on in the process. Um, I think the the biggest thing um, is that uh, when I, I was writing Hulk versus, uh, I was writing a Thor versus Hulk story, and uh, I had a had a story about a planet getting sucked into a black hole, um, I, like they get teleported onto this planet that's being pulled toward this black hole, and like I wrote the scene and I showed it to a friend, and they were like, "That's not how black holes work," and I was like, "All right, well, I guess." We're gonna have Bruce Banner explain on panel that that's not how black holes work, which is is what happened. Because Thor goes, "Well, this is what's happening." Bruce Banner goes, "That's not how black holes work. They work like this, and that this is what's gonna happen." And uh, everybody goes, "Shut up, Bruce." <laughs> uh, which I don't know. That 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 tickled me doing doing that bit, and uh, you know we got to play with the the physics of it a bit, but uh, I, I caught myself beforehand thanks to uh, a friend and was like, all right, let's explain how it actually does work and then just have nobody care in the comic. Yeah, well, I think mine, pet peeve, I think it's a little different, more along the lines of you're not really supposed to eat in a lab or in a chemistry lab setting, but then in, I guess, in comics people can't really die right away, so they do things that we aren't really supposed to do. I mean, it's not like the science is wrong, but the actual good practice isn't there. Yeah. So sometimes those things like, oh, you're drinking out of the beaker. Mm, okay. <laughs> good for you. I mean, I actually have a beaker coffee cup, though. That's a different so... story, yes. <laughs> I feel like society is telling me I can drink out of the beakers now. <laughs> you didn't take that into the lab. That's the problem. Um, Okay, so probably don't take my beaker coffee mug and put it next to my beaker chemistry. Yeah, okay. yeah. I got it. That is a superhero origin story. <laughs> so I should do it, is what you're saying. <laughs> I actually had the joy of, um, for Mythbusters Junior this last summer, practicing animal husbandry, which is not what it sounds like. Uh, it's actually where you take care of animals um, for 20 golden orb spiders. And it was really cool because the people that brought them in study biomimicry and they look at them because um, spiders work a lot like hydraulic systems do. A spider, you can rip off its leg and it'll heal, but if you puncture it um, like a hydraulic system, it'll leak out and it'll actually end up dying. So the running joke was that we all were hoping we would turn into Spider-Man at the end of the episode because we all got to like hold these beautiful giant spiders. It didn't happen, or at least it's delayed effect. I don't know. I can't quite tell at this moment. Sure, it didn't happen. <laughs> that's why That's why nobody's uh, beat Spider-Man yet. They haven't tried punching holes in him. Oh. I mean, I feel like if you puncture a spider, it, it then has grounds to bite you and make you Spider-Man. It's just retaliating. I mean, you guys saw into the Spider-Verse. Right. So we want to also take some time and open it up to the floor to ask some questions because that's how we get some of the best discussions going up here. So if anyone has some questions, feel free to line up at the mic or if you can yell, 
I probably wouldn't recommend that because it is day one of Comic-Con. But um, feel free to come to the mic. And while people are trying to become brave, you, you got this. I know you have some great questions. Just line up. We might have a prize for you if you do it. We might not. We might. So during their lineup process, do you guys want to each tell them where they can find you both here at Con and on the interwebs? ISC, NC State ISC, is that yeah. on Facebook and Twitter? <laughs> I always get the orders mixed up. Mixed up. If it's and Instagram. They're on all three. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I am, I, I have a website, which is just jeremywhitley.com, but uh, I am actually spend, unfortunately, more time on Twitter, uh, where it's uh, at jrome58, so J-R-O-M-E-5-8. And uh, on Tumblr, if you know what that is, uh, it's princelscomic.tumblr.com. Uh, I'm also on the BAB website, as at the ISB, that's T H E I S B. I also have a table over there, I think it's oh, yeah, uh, I 405, uh, A405. And my restock order for all my books did not come in, so I have a real good shot at selling everything. This con, and I really need some help with that. So if all of you could just come to the table and just grab something on it, I could go home and be like, babe, great news. I sold everything I took to the con. Do they need to give you money for these books? Yes. Okay. <laughs> They're good, though. Clarify. Can it be crypto they, coin? They have relatively good signs. <laughs> That's a lie. It's very bad. They do go into a VR world at one point, but it's a very 90s VR world. Do you want to say your table number? Oh, yes. I am at uh, 502. Uh, I'm right at the end. I'm easy to find. So he's at 502, and I have no idea what number I'm at, but I'm directly across from him, which is why I needed him to say that. One of us is 501, and one of us is 502. I'm not sure which Oh, number the numbers is. go that way? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think I'm 501. At, if you're standing at Tamara's table and you turn around and look past Jeremy, you can see me. So that's a good way to just Don't hit everybody's table. They, they did separate us this year. They learned last year not to put us together anymore. But I'm also um, on all forms of social media as at TLynR85. Um, so T-L-Y-N-N-R at 85. And uh, most recently, actually, as of yesterday, you can also find me at at SOS.comicbook on Instagram because um, we just launched a science-based outreach comic. Uh, we've donated like 500 copies in the last week to kids to get them inspired. So check that out as well. We really don't have anyone that wants to ask a question. Come on, there's no stupid questions. You might get some stupid answers, but we promise you. No one? Come on, be brave. Who's going to be brave? Come on, Matt. You got a question. Matt, you got a question. Come on. You're getting your eyes. You've got some curiosity. You have, a, you have an inquisitive mind. I do, um, but I've been called out, so I, I missed many of your questions, so I apologize if this has already been there, um, but I'm wondering, I know that, that Tamara, you're so involved in making sure that science is accessible to so many people, and I'm wondering, with comics as a medium, it's, it's changing the access, right? It's getting to kids who don't have the right channels for these particular science shows, but where do we get diversity of access, like, are we reaching um, gender across the spectrum in the same way with comic books or, or sci-fi shows? Are we reaching um, all of the, the ways that we identify as far as race or culture? Um, how can we expand that? Yeah, I think, I think that's an amazing question, and it's definitely something that um, is the reasoning behind why I do superhero science. So for me, comics are naturally inclusive. They're naturally diverse. Um, you can get comics at Free Comic Book Day. Um, you can get 99 cent comics. Um, comics are available now digitally. They're available hard copy. Um, it is something that getting them in the hands of everyone, I think, is harder. Um, I think if you have the ability to get to a comic book store, that's great. But you know, there's not always comic book stores that are that are around or nearby. So I love that digital is becoming a thing because it is more approachable. But again, not everyone has a computer or the internet or access to these. Um, and so it's something that I know at least I've been talking to a lot of um, teachers and academics, and as well as um, library 
libraries about whether or not they carry comics and if it's something that they would be willing to start looking at doing. Um, and it's always a question of, of funding and who's able to do it. So I know right now for our outreach, for instance, we give out digital copies um, and we do a Tom's model. You buy a hard copy, we donate 10 copies. Um, but we, we have, we are wrestling with that as well because we're like, how do we make sure that if they have this link that they're actually able to access it later? Um, and so our answer right now is that we're trying to work with nonprofits to get grants to be able to have the tangible hard copy to give them. Um, but actually we're doing a panel tomorrow on the science and tech of Captain Marvel and one of the things I'm going to talk about in that is that the whole reason Captain Marvel came to be was the feminist movement that said we want a comic that inspires little girls just as much as it inspires little boys. Um, and so she became that voice and that, that kind of statue for them to start bringing in um, women viewership and readers. But it's definitely something that, that needs more work. And, I think someone that does it extremely well is Unstoppable Wasp that Jeremy writes. It's, I mean, it's incredible. He elevates living scientists, and you're, you want to speak to like why or how or? Uh, yeah, I think uh, one of our one of our big goals in there was uh, to sort of promote science within this story, um, both by having you know some some real science in in the issues and having a, a character for whom like science is there their primary method of, of being a superhero. Um, you know, Nadia punches people occasionally, but uh, most of her problems are, are solved with science. Um, even, even some of the punching ones. Um, but <laughs> um, I, I think uh, a big thing that we thought a lot about when we started launching that comic was, um, you know, being able to, to go from superhero to having the science stuff in there to relating that back to real life in a way that felt like that wasn't just a superhero thing. That's a, a thing that you know you you can do that you can be part of. And uh, you know we we did that by uh, you know featuring real scientists. Uh, we've had Tamara in there um, uh, along with a, a number of other folks. Uh, you know where we said you know okay this is this is a person who is an actual scientist. This is what they do. We would interview them sort of. Uh, break down how they got into science, what it is they study, how they how they do this stuff, and you know some of their connections to comic books and pop culture and stuff as well. Um, so that you know, that there's not this impression of uh, science and scientists as being this um, elite thing that only certain people can do or only certain types of people can do. Um, because yeah, I mean that was I, I mentioned in, in my earlier panel that uh, you know we made a, an intentional decision to. Uh, reach out to a diverse group of female scientists for this story uh, so that we can make sure that we have um, you know the a group of people that the different sorts of people can relate to so you know we, we made sure to reach out to um, a couple of, of trans women we made sure to reach out to uh, you know women of different races and ethnicities and uh, you know, queer women and, and that all that stuff is there so that you know when somebody sees the comic and sees this as something that uh, you know they might want to be part of, they can then perhaps see themselves reflected in the back of that comic and, and say, oh, well, that is something I can do because this person did it. Um, you know, and that's, the, that's an important bridge piece to me because I think, you know, it's nice to be able to, to see, uh, you know, Captain Marvel uh, and to see a, a woman with superpowers on the big screen, but... Um, not all of us are going to be hopefully in some sort of horrible accident and, and get uh, special powers. Um, so, you know, it, it's good that, uh, you know, people know that's not the only way to get into science is by being in a horrible accident. <laughs> I mean, Tamara was, but I mean, that's, that's how she got her science powers. That's how I got my science powers. I like also that um, with Ensemble Wasps, they're younger girls too. So you're also bridging that age gap of the idea that you have to be older to be able to start change and to help the world where, I mean, right now, I don't know how many of you have noticed, but this next generation that's coming up is already changing the world every day. It's one of the most inspiring things to see what the kids are doing today. Yeah, I think um, that was a cool thing. And when we brought Wasp back, uh, I had, uh, at that point, gotten to know uh, Julie Sage pretty well, who is the, the first person we, we interviewed when we came back, who is, uh, what is Julie now? I'd say 14? 
14? Yeah, she, she's 13 or 14, and she's already like inventing stuff, knows more about science than I will ever know. Um, and you know, she's she's so on top of things. She's got her own little like YouTube channel. She is uh, so ahead of the game. And like, there are so many other like. Once I started talking to her, she's like, "Oh, you should interview this person as well. They're you know a year younger than me, and they make robots." And it's like, really? Like, okay, you guys are doing it. Uh, I live over in Durham, and uh, support your local comic crew. Uh, I. I saw uh, Mae Jemison speak on Wednesday. She was at the Carolina Theater uh, downtown. Uh, does everybody know who Mae Jemison is? Uh, for those of you who don't, uh, she is the first black woman to go to space. Uh, she is an astronaut and a medical doctor and has nine doctorates. She's super cool. She's the best. Uh, and one of the things that she said that blew my mind uh, she was like, yeah, if we, if we really wanted to go to Mars, we could do that today. And I thought like that, I was like, oh, okay. And the thing that she said was that because of that, like Mars does not interest her as a destination. And the thing that she is interested in is interstellar travel. And the reason is, because if you think about all the things you need to travel from Earth to Alpha Centauri, if we get 1% of the way towards that technology, that is a drastic change for life on Earth. And I feel the same way about what we do with, with comics, in that if we, if we get 1% of the way towards PIM particles, uh, then, then that is an incredible achievement. If we get you know, 1% of the way towards any comic book science that you see, then that's an amazing achievement. And I feel like there's stuff that's in comics that we have gotten pretty close to, and there's stuff that's in sci-fi. Like, you can talk to a computer now if you want. It will not make you tea. It might make you pizza soon. Apparently it can make you a cocktail. I think actually you can now use Siri to start an automated coffee machine, so it could make you tea if it, you put a teapot in there. And you can tell Siri to order you a pizza. <laughs> yes. Which is slightly different. And so can your commercials, by the way, so be careful. <laughs> but like, that is, that is, 40 years ago, that is the stuff of fiction. Uh, and now it's, it's something that... We take for granted every day that we are walking around with supercomputers in our pockets that connect to satellites to tell us how to get to the pizza restaurant. That's, that's bananas. Uh, so I love the idea of our job as the people who get to imagine all the stuff. And our job as the people who get to go, okay, well, wouldn't it be cool if this happened? Like, like wouldn't it be cool if, if you know, Tony Stark's armor could just move around on his body and was controlled by his brain? Like in Armor Wars 2. Man knows what I'm talking about. Uh, and, and then, you know, like that, because that does put the idea in people's heads. Like, a lot of archaeologists became archaeologists either because of Indiana Jones or Scrooge McDuck. And that's like a really cool thing. Like, it's a really cool effect that. Very disappointing. <laughs> yeah, there's no giant boulders trying to kill you, unfortunately. Unfortunately? I don't know. Uh, but yeah, like, I think that's a really cool thing that we get to do on our side that in a small way helps to shape the things that smart people do. I mean, literally, we have drones because in 1957, Batman had a surveillance drone that was literally just a ball and it went by his window and he could start watching people and then Lockheed was like, we want that. Wait, Lockheed the dragon? No, Lockheed Martin. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that we can be like, cool VR headset, but what if it was a room, you know? <laughs> that's, that's our job. <laughs> I like that you extrapolate the existing, push it further, and then a child comes and goes, I can make that happen. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Any more questions? Anyone get brave while we were talking? No? This is the quietest group we've had. It's a very chill evening. Yeah. Oh, yes. Hello. Hi, how's it going? Good. Doing okay, how are you? Pretty good. Um, so, this is for a Reddit angle question. i um been recently looking at a lot of movies and whatnot, mainly stuff based at, based on the 80s, and, and so far, like, I think the best, you know, best thing out right now, like I've seen after all that, is just pretty much the 80s era of movies and whatnot. But based on that, on based on uh, if you look, you've enjoyed the 80s or whatnot, what's the best thing you can take from now that you wish 
well besides cell phones and whatnot, that might be, you know, pretty effective for, you know, back in the 80s. Mm, wow. What do I wish I had in the 80s other than clothes that matched and weren't different neon colors? Um, <laughs> Hmm. I actually would not miss my phone if I didn't have this phone that does everything, including keeping me up all night. If I you wouldn't... didn't have a phone that was a constant window into a nightmare world? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know what's weird? Uh, I was just thinking about uh, Back to the Future Part 2. It came out in 1989, and it's like the, the future section of that is in 2015. And there's you know, flying cars, there's holograms. Hoverboards. But there's also, there's hoverboards. But there's also, like, I can go to McDonald's now and there's, like, a touch screen that I order on, you know? Uh, or, or I can just tell my phone what I want and go pick it up at Starbucks. But nobody imagined the internet. <laughs> nobody, nobody was like, yeah, but, but what, if, what if TV wasn't really a thing anymore? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good point, actually. Uh, but yeah, like, uh, as far as what I would take back, it sure would be nice to have gotten started on electric cars 30 years earlier, uh -huh. I think. That would, that would have been a good technology, yeah, to start sooner. Uh, I, don't know. I don't think I could live without the internet, so... But is that cheating? Is that, but that's different from smartphones, right? So I could still say internet. <laughs> you know what's interesting, actually, is in Star Trek, I was reading that the whole reason that um, the computer would talk to them was just because looking at a computer and researching something isn't visually pleasing for an audience to see on television. So you could take the internet, and maybe, maybe they did have it, but they just realized that that was boring TV and didn't put it on there. Okay. So maybe it just Yeah. This is really an internet in Star Trek. They just don't talk about it. Yeah. That's, that's all the It's actually serious the whole time. Uh, I, I think, um, I think it, for, me, for me, it's a toss up uh, because uh, I don't, I did not live for very long in a world where I was driving and there wasn't some form of GPS. <laughs> um, like, you know, the first several years I was driving, I was in a relatively small town, and I knew where everything was. Distinguished uh, guests of the North Carolina Comic Con. I, I don't know. Yeah. In just 10 or 15 yeah. minutes at 7 p.m., we have me, Beast Boy, on the main stage on the convention floor. He's your favorite part of Teen Titans Go. Now is your chance to learn more about the man who gives Beast Boy that distinctive voice, Greg Sykes. <coughs> He's coming right next. Yeah. Right here. You We're guys make can us literally leave. not move yeah. and, and enjoy that. Um, I, I think for me it's a toss-up between yeah, uh, GPS because I don't know how people found things before. Um, because, like, I, I find the restaurant I want to eat at on Yelp, and then I look it up on my uh, Google, and that's how I find the things that I want to do. I guess people just had to know things or look at maps or talk to other people before. <laughs> and all of those things sound terrible. Um, and the other thing is uh, uh, Netflix. Uh, not, not maybe necessarily Netflix specifically, but uh, streaming uh, TV in general. Um, because I, I was having this conversation with my wife the other day where I was uh, relating how much of that 70s show I had seen despite not liking that 70s show, because it came on after I got home from school. And that is a world that my, parent, that my children will never have to live in, a world where they have to watch that 70s show. Or Drew Carey, like, how many episodes of the Drew Carey show did I see? Yeah. And like, I don't like Drew Carey. Why did I watch so many episodes of the Drew Carey show? It was because it was on at like 3.30 on like the, one of the four channels my TV got. My kids, like, they just turn on whatever they want to see. Like, my my two year old has seen all of She-Ra three times because that's what she wants to see. When like we were we went on vacation at one point and the idea to my seven year old that like she had to wait for something to come on that she wanted to see was like mind blowing and disgusting to her. <laughs> that like the the thing she wanted to see was on at seven thirty and it was four o'clock. What was she supposed to watch between now and then? It has not been that long that this is the case. And it yeah. I can't even imagine not being able to hear any song I wanted whenever I wanted. 
Can you imagine having to wait till 10 p.m. to watch something? Bananas. Yeah. What's your favorite uh, 80s movie? Uh, so far, um, I have to say, like, Beverly Hills Cop 1 and 2. Yes. Like, have, like, pretty much those. Dying, those sir. It, sorry? Dying, sir. <laughs> you watch Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, so, like, one of the, like, I guess that was the main thing that was like, man, I love the 80s. Then I found out, then, like, I'm. You know, I just found like so much, so many things like from like, I found out the song 19, uh, is it 1999 by Prince? You know, the sounds from that, from pure 80s. And I'm like, wow, I wish, you know, sometimes I kind of wish that I was, you know, from the 80s a little bit. And you know, it's just like, there's like so much if I could list right now, like, it's just one of the things that I'm just like, Here, I just enjoy it. Here's the thing though. This is kind of like springing off of what we just said. People have asked me before, like, what was the best era in comics, right? Best era in comics, or best era in movies, or best era in music. And the answer is always right now. Because right now, you can do that. You can watch any movie from the 80s you want. You can read any comic. I actually, um, like, I actually just made a little uh, thing of music based on how 80s synths and synthesizers and everything. I just literally just made it like a few few weeks ago because I was just that inspired. Did Plus you, you use a have... guitar? Oh, sorry. Did you use a guitar? I just, I just used my laptop. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, if it were cool. the 80s, you would have to go to several like record shops or <laughs> Sam Goody. Right. Yeah, and, and go buy like a few hundred dollars worth of tapes to get all that music uh, and then you would have to make yourself a mixtape. Do you remember mixing? Which would take things. hours. You have to have but one that's why you show you love someone. You give them an hours long with the radio, and you had to call the get DJ, the and you get it, just and then you missed up. it. Just <laughs> ending. You got to wait again until he plays it. He's like, I can't play it again for another hour. You just have to talk to radio DJs, guys, instead of just going to your iTunes or whatever else you use. Thank that was a great you. question. No Thank, you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate it. So. We are going to have to go because Beast Boy is coming, which, which is really cool. If you've never seen him talk, he's, he's very animated, amazing. I've had he's the great. joy of, of watching him talk on some Teen Titans Go panels. So stick around for that. And if you have questions for us, find <laughs> us. We're here all weekend. We hope to see you. And if you want to go to a really great engineering college, go to NC State. We'll pack. We'll pack. <laughs> <laughs> We're biased. <coughs> Very biased. <coughs> but thank you all. What? Wait, what? Did you want? That one? No. Huh? I don't know what y'all are talking about. I dropped out we're of just, the University we're of South We're just turning Carolina. off Jeremy's mic because he didn't say NC State. Um, but thank you all for joining us. And if you want to hear more about superhero science, come tomorrow. We're going to be doing the science and tech of Captain Marvel at 2 o'clock, the same spot. So you already know where to find it. You don't need a GPS. It's pretty easy. Um, but we want to thank all of you for being here. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.